Good morning, everyone. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today for uh, Bethel Sunday Live. So glad to have you with us uh, this Sunday morning. I pray that God has uh, blessed you mightily and that uh, his grace has been abundant in your life. I know that he has been uh, abundant in ours. God has supplied all of our needs and many of our wants, and we are so grateful uh, to him. We thank God for sending us to the kingdom for such a time as this. Uh, no matter how difficult the times may seem to you, uh, God is able. And if you could write down that funeral information for me, I'd appreciate it. It's going to come through my email. It is All right. Uh, I did want to make a couple of announcements. Um, one of it, which is that we want to pray for the uh, Trice family as they lay their loved one uh Brother Trice's daughter uh, lay her to rest. I was looking for uh, a message regarding that. I haven't gotten it yet, but if I get it during the course of the service, then I'll share that information with you. I've also been asked by our own church clerk at Bethel to make sure that you know you can mail your tithes in, uh, just regular snail mail, mail your tithes in to Bethel at P.O. Box 11664, uh, Los Angeles, California. 90011. Again, just address it to Bethel Church. Uh, and again, that P.O. Box is 11664. P.O. Box 11664, Los Angeles, uh, California. So I want to get that out there uh, before I said anything, before I forget that. Um, again, want to encourage you. Thank you for joining uh, your. Sunday school on Sunday mornings uh, at Bethel. It's with uh, Deacon Andre Smith. Uh, thank you for joining midweek Bible study and prayer with our assistant pastor, Willie Witt. Thank you for joining me on Wednesday nights for our midweek scripture study, which uh, happens on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Thank you. Wednesdays at 7 p.m. And uh, for those of you who join us, you can join us by the Facebook page, the church's Facebook page, um, which obviously you would be viewing us on right now, if not the YouTube channel. Uh, you could also join us by a WebEx. So for those of you who work in offices and you have meetings with WebEx often, you already have the little app downloaded to your device. Uh, it would be easy for you. For others of you who don't have any idea of what WebEx is, um, the blessing of having a WebEx account for the church is that now we can interact with you when you join. You can talk to me, I can talk directly to you, as opposed to chatting on Facebook, which is a little bit more clunky, but we did make it work this past week. Um, but if you join us on WebEx, it's a lot more dynamic and uh, it's easier to manage our conversation. So I put some instructions on the church's Facebook page. Uh, I've also put it on my personal Facebook page. Uh, so if you look there, you'll find that. Just try it out. You can try it out anytime. You don't have to wait till we meet on Wednesday night. You can go in right now and follow those instructions. It will get you to the meeting space. There just won't be any meeting there. Uh, so we do encourage you. We're gonna try to do a tutorial, a live tutorial, walk folks through it. I, I'd like more people to use that if possible, but by all means, if you can't, continue to join us on the Facebook page. I've uh, arranged it so I can see your input on the chat and I can respond to you live. If you were with us last Wednesday, you watched that occur in real time. Folks would pop in during the Bible study and say hello, and I was able to respond to them in real time. Uh, all right, so here's the information reg regarding the home going service for Courtney LaVon Trice, uh, the daughter of Brother Floyd Trice. Uh, the services will be held at Harris and Ross Mortuary, 1839 East Firestone Boulevard, 18. 39 East Firestone Boulevard, Los Angeles, California. So it's Harris and Ross Mortuary, 1839 East Firestone Boulevard. There's a viewing on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, the 26th, from noon to 4. So you can go to a viewing there between noon to 4 on Wednesday. And then on Thursday at 10 a.m., uh, there will be uh, a service for her. The services are provided in the parking lot and there will be social distancing. And I'm fairly certain, I'm absolutely certain they'll want you to wear a mask there also. So be prepared to do that. Um, if you cannot make the viewing, 
and or if you cannot make that following Thursday service. So viewing this Wednesday between noon and, noon and four, the service on Thursday at 10 a.m., um, there will be Zoom information forthcoming. So listen for that, look for that. We'll try to make sure that information gets around as much as we can. Again, masks will be required uh, if you're attending either the viewing on Wednesday or the service on Thursday. And just one more time for clarity's sake, Harris and Ross Mortuary, 1839 East Firestone Boulevard, Los Angeles, California. Viewing on Wednesday between noon and four. Uh, service on Thursday at 10 a.m. at that location. Okay. Let's continue to pray for the Trice uh, family as they lay their loved one to rest. It's always difficult to lose uh, folks we love no matter what the circumstances. It's especially difficult to lose them when they're so young uh, and to use them, lose them in the way that uh, she was lost to us. So we pray for the family. Um, we're going to pray for all families who are struggling today. I watched a little uh, news last night and I saw that, uh, I forget what state this was, probably could have been California though, where there were a line of families uh, waiting to pick up boxes of free groceries because they were having a difficult time. I saw during that same broadcast, I saw another story where there, uh, there's a historic number of families who are facing eviction in September. So families are hungry, uh, they're facing homelessness. It's a very difficult time really for the world, not just our country. And as believers, we have to be prayerful and then also be helpful. If you are able to donate to something, if you get that opportunity, or you can even seek out that opportunity to give, then I encourage you to do that. Um, Paul says that he had heard uh, that Jesus had once remarked that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I know that's true for me. Giving gives me energy. It doesn't take my energy. It gives me energy. I'm blessed by the very act of giving. I'm not looking for anything in return. And if you're a giver, you share that experience. And so you bless yourself by giving to another. So we do encourage you to seek out opportunities to bless others who are struggling during this time and do not have access to the, the things that you have access to. Uh, we are light and we are salt on the earth, but we're also a physical manifestation of God's love. We are a physical manifestation of God's love. And so all these things that we do in terms of our giving are our way of ministering to those who do not know the grace, the saving grace of God. So it's just another way for you to evangelize and represent your Father and represent your Lord uh, through your giving to those who are in need. So we encourage you to do that. Um, today we're going to be in the book of Luke chapter 10. So as I'm speaking, I'm going to encourage you to turn there. Uh, we're going to have a special prayer today uh, that God would bless those who are in need, those who are suffering, those who are mourning, that God would be their consolation and their comfort and lighten the load on their hearts. Those of you who are struggling financially, we're going to pray for God's bounty in your life. Uh, I believe it was David who said, I once was young, but now I am old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor God's seed out begging for bread. God will provide. Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. So you need to know that today. If you are a child of God, do not fear. Do not be dismayed. Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Be thankful. Uh, God is supplying all of your needs just the way he promised that he would. You need to believe that. Luke chapter 10 is where we're going to be today. Before we actually read that uh, portion of scripture, it'll be verses 38 through 42. Before we read that portion of scripture, I just want to uh, have a special word of prayer with us. Uh, as I mentioned before, Father, we thank you for your loving kindness today. We thank you for your grace that falls fresh on our life every day. Lord, as we think about it, we woke up this morning uh, in a bed, most of us, if not all of us. Um, we were able to eat last night and today we are clothed. We are cared for. We feel protected. We feel secure. Uh, we feel provided for. But we know that there are those who do not have those same realities in their lives. They do not know where their next meal is coming from. They 
do not know if they will have shelter from day to day or are facing not having shelter in the very near future. There are those who do not have a reasonable portion of health, whether it be COVID or some other uh, affliction has beset them. They do not have coverage to get the best quality of care. They are suffering physically. Uh, there are those who are suffering emotionally, who are gripped by a spirit of depression, some by circumstantial depression. There are those who are considering giving up on life because things just seem overwhelming and unmanageable. There are those who think that there can't be a brighter future. There are those who don't have hope, who don't have faith. Father, we cast these before you today. In all of these circumstances, we know that your grace is sufficient. We pray for those who are struggling today in all of these different ways. We pray that their needs are met. Beyond that, we pray that they know you as the meter of those needs, the one who has promised to supply all of our needs. Those of us who are members of the household of faith, I pray, God, that those who do not know you in the pardon of their sin would come to do so, that someone would be sent their way to share with them the gospel, that the gospel that has been shared with some would bear fruit in their lives, that we have opportunities to share your gospel with others and win them to your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, have your way through us. We pray that your kingdom would be established here just as it is in heaven that you this day would give us our daily bread so that we are wholly reliant upon you and recognizing that you are the supplier of all that we need. As we come together today, we pray for those who have lost a loved one. Father, we pray for comfort, for strength, the kind of strength that only you can give. Father, as we encounter those who have lost, as we struggle to find words of comfort and encouragement, we pray that a spirit of love would transfer from heart to heart, that they would know that they are loved and surrounded by love and support. Father, I pray that in the days and the weeks, the months to come, that you would lighten their load and replace their mourning with joy. God, I know that you can do it. I know that you want us to have joy because your joy the scripture says, is our strength, and you desire that we be strong. Now, as we go into the word today, I pray, God, that you would help us to clear our minds, open our hearts and our ears to receive the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. Help us not only to receive the word, but to process it, apply it, understand it, grow by it, God, your word is life, it is bread, it is life to us. Breathe that life into us just now. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Thank God. Amen. We want your hearts to be encouraged today. God is still in control. Amen. Luke chapter 10 is where we're going to be today. Luke chapter 10. We're going to, uh, for those of you who've been in church in a while, this is going to be a very familiar passage to you, as pretty much all passages are now. You know, if you've been in church for decades, you've heard sermons on just about everything. But I, I hope that you believe that God can give you fresh understanding, fresh perspective, that he can speak to you where you are today. All right? The last time you read this particular passage in Luke chapter 10, you may have been a different place in your life and it didn't resonate with you, didn't hit you the way it may hit you today. I find that to be true of God's word. Luke chapter 10, I'm going to be reading to you from the King James Version of the Bible where it says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, this is Jesus, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house and she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful 
and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. One thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. One thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. We pray that God will bless the hearing and the reading of his holy word. Today we're going to talk about the needful thing. Luke 10, 38 through 42. Uh, 42. What is the needful thing? This particular passage is not a departure from what we've been talking about for the last few weeks, which is understanding the times in which we live and positioning ourselves as believers to be of maximum effect in this time. Nothing nothing uh, situates you, positions you to weather a storm like being in the right place. Think about it. When the storm comes, if you're in the right place, you'll be okay. In uh, an actual life situation, that might be a root cellar, some structure that is strong enough to withstand the strength of winds that are coming at you. But when we talk about being in the right place in Christ, it talk, uh, we, we're talking about being in the right place in your life. By place, we don't mean physical place as much as we mean emotional place. Relying upon the joy and the peace of God and not the joy and the peace that comes from circumstances. That's being in the right place. Having joy and peace despite your current circumstances. Being in the right place. Being in the right place mentally. Being in the right place in terms of your purpose in God. Having some level of understanding that. Listen, all of this is iterative. It changes over time. We become clear over time about who we are and whose we are and what we should be doing. But at any given time, the scripture says that God has given every man a measure of faith. So no matter where you are in your life, if you, if you just gave your life to the Lord five minutes ago, five years ago, 50 years ago, you have the measure of faith you need to withstand the storms at that place in your life. Remember last week we said that every purpose has a season. Well, who coordinates those seasons? God does. So wherever you are in life, God knew you would be there and he's given you what you need to sustain you wherever you are. So no matter what storms are in you or around you, God has given you all the tools that you need to not just even withstand the storm, but to overcome the storm. So you need to understand that. Storms do come into every life. Everybody's going through something. Paul writes that to the church at Corinth. There has no temptation taking you, but such that is common to man. You're not going through anything that others have not gone through. And whatever you're going through, God has the power to bring you out. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with that trouble, temptation, with those challenges, temptation, will with that temptation also make a way of escape he already has a plan to deliver you so that you can bear it. Okay. So please understand that. There's nothing that you're in that God can't get you out of, but you do have to trust him. So you have everything you need to get you through the storm, and you need to expect that storms will come. Every man born of a woman is but a few days and filled with trouble. So trouble comes into every life. But God gives us the ability to withstand the storm. To do so, you have to be in the right position, was my original point. You have to be in the right position, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Prayed up, which means a regular prayer life, a daily prayer life. And I don't just mean when you wake up in the morning and go to bed at night, but a consistent conversation and dialogue with God throughout the day where you speak to him and you are open to him speaking to you and it's happening organically or naturally all throughout the day. You're holding this ongoing conversation with God. You're also studying the Word of God. If you're a preacher, if you're a teacher in the Word of God, you're not just studying the Word of God to uh, develop some lesson or develop a, a sermon, but as a preacher, as a teacher, you're also studying the Word of God so that you yourself may find yourself in the Word and be strengthened by that experience. We all need the word of God. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth or cometh out of the mouth of God. We all need the word. So you need to be in the right place spiritually. When you aren't in the right place spiritually, 
emotionally, mentally, spiritually. When you aren't in the right place and the storm comes, then you end up behaving outside of the character of Christ. You start to behave in ways that demonstrate you weren't ready. You weren't ready for what was coming at you. You weren't ready for the, the weight of responsibility that you were going to face. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know where you belong and you can't plug into the plan of God. You begin to behave that way. And part of that behavior is panic. Part of that behavior is frustration, vexation, anger, bitterness, resentment. And very often what you'll find is you have that frustration, that bitterness, that anger, and you don't even understand why. You don't necessarily know that it's against anyone. You just feel it inside yourself. You feel unsettled. We are going to look at this situation today and we're going to find two people. We're going to find two people. We're going to find somebody who attaches themselves to Christ in behavior that represents worship. We're also going to find somebody who tries to find themselves in Christ by attaching to him to him through work without worship. And in that 42nd verse, when Christ says to Martha that Mary has the better part, it's because she has chosen worship. Not that work was not necessary, but she made worship her priority. She made worship her first thing. She saw worship as the needful thing. And that's what we're going to have to do in this age. We're going to have to see worship as the needful thing. We are being challenged because we are not meeting in the ways we used to meet. We're not doing things the way we used to do them. And we are finding that that religion gave us great comfort. And when that religious routine is disrupted, many of us are disrupted. And primarily because... We were positioned firmly in our religion, but perhaps not so firmly in our relationships with Christ. COVID cannot interrupt your relationship with Christ. And again, as we said last week and in former weeks, when we are linked together, and we said this in Bible study, when we are linked together in Christ, we are truly linked together in a way that that overcomes even physical presence, that is us congregating physically together. We are so tied together in Christ that no matter where we are as believers, we as believers are connected to one another because we're connected to Jesus. And that happens in worship. That happens in worship. So let's look at what the situation becomes. When we talk about work, we are talking about um, activity that's done to achieve a purpose to bring about a desired result. And so we're doing things. And all of us know that when it comes to the church, there is no little work to be done. Many of you have heard about the uh, 2080 principle. 20% 20 of the people in the church are doing 80% of the work. Um, and I think in many of our churches, perhaps our church at Bethel, perhaps your church, wherever you go to, you found that to be a case that a minority of the people are doing a majority of the work. That's what we're talking about. And I think if you're honest with yourself and you're one of those workers, sometimes you are doing so much work that you don't benefit from a worship experience. You are so overwhelmed, overridden by the responsibilities of the church whatever those responsibilities are. That church for you is just another job. It's just another task, another chore in the course of the day that has to be uh, taken care of. That, that church represents something that drains your energy, does not give you energy, draws from your strength, but does not give you strength. So you are very much tied to the work of the church. But we must be careful that in all that working, we don't lose ourselves and disconnect ourselves from the worship experience. That church, and for those of you listening to me on the phone, I'm doing air quotes because we use that word incorrectly so often. You'd have to come to Bible study on Wednesday nights. We'll talk about that. 
But when we think about church, we think about it mostly in the terms of the work that we are doing, the services and the programs. Church is primarily, firstly, mostly supposed to describe a worship experience. And the work supports that rather than worship just being an excuse to come and do work. And so Martha finds herself about activities that are done purposefully. She does have a goal or a result in mind, but worship is not it. So then we have to ask ourselves, is Martha doing the necessary things, the needful things? Is she taking care of the priorities? Does she understand what things come first when it comes to her relationship to Jesus Christ? Does Martha, the woman who is in the kitchen, and the scripture says that she's overwhelmed by all the tasks to prepare for this meal with Jesus, that she's frustrated and she's upset that she's not getting the kind of help she thinks she needs, and somebody right there felt that. You felt that because you have that same frustration that you are in the church working and you're not getting the kind of help you need. And it's weighing on you. It's overwhelming you. The fact that all of these things need to be done. And it's amazing. It doesn't matter how small a church is. You're always going to have those folks in the church who are overwhelmed by the responsibilities. 15 members in the church, and yet these folks are always overwhelmed by their responsibilities. The work has overtaken the worship experience, and we can't let that be the case. Martha feels abandoned by her sister. When she talks to Jesus, she says, why don't you tell her to come in this kitchen with me? Is there anybody in the audience today, anybody who's listening to me right now, who feels like you are not getting the help in church work that you need? You feel like you are carrying uh, an imbalanced weight upon your shoulder? There are some of you generally in life who feel that way. As a parent, you feel that way. As a spouse, you feel that way. As a worker, you feel that way. You feel like you're carrying a disproportionate amount of the load and it's weighing on you. And Martha goes a step forward. She cries out to the Lord, make her, talking about Mary, Lord, make her help me. Shouldn't she be in this kitchen with me? Martha feels overwhelmed by her responsibilities. A lot to be done, and she's the only one doing it. Now, we're going to have to wait for 42 for that, verse 42, for that to be addressed. But I just want to say to that right now, please understand when Jesus talks about the needful thing, the fact that Mary is doing the needful thing, if something's going to go undone, if there is not enough labor to get things done, if something's going to go undone, it can't be worship. And so if you're in a situation where you're working, 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 working to the point where you don't have time to worship the Lord, then you need to reorient and reprioritize. That goes for work in the church. You are working so much and so hard in the church that you don't enjoy the worship experience anymore. Because even as you sit there under the word and under the songs uh, or the hymns to, to, to God, even as you sit there, you feel beset by the weight of responsibility that's upon your shoulders. Some of you literally are working yourselves to death just in life, trying to make money to pay your bills. And you work so hard, you have no time, no energy to give to God. Then you have misprioritized. You have misprioritized. If you're working so hard, you have no energy nor time to give to worship to God. And when I talk about worship, I'm talking about activities that esteem his worth, his value, that show adoration, praise to him that demonstrate you understand the value of God in your life. If you don't have time for that kind of stuff, to join in lifting your hands to God and, and exclaiming his glory, to, to join in singing songs of Zion, not just from your throat and your mouth, but from your heart, to experience the presence of God wherever you are, if you don't have enough time to experience the presence of God, if you're sitting there right now feeling guilty because as you think about it, you don't remember the last time you were able just to sit still and experience the presence of God, might I suggest to you that you have misprioritized in your life. And when you do so, 
and life's storms come, because you are out of position, you will feel overwhelmed by life's responsibility. Jesus, uh, excuse me, Martha also, I sense, feels overlooked by Jesus, who she turns to about her issue with Mary. See, she understands that Jesus carries a certain authority by way of influence. And she feels as though if he would set things in order, again, air quotes, her sense of what order is, that things will go better for her. Lord, make her help me. Somebody who's listening to me right now, you have attributed your burden in life, your feelings of being overwhelmed and having too much responsibility in life. You've made that God's problem. You've prayed, Lord, take this weight off of me. So I want you to know that God sent me especially to you today. He sent me to especially talk to you today to tell you there's nothing for him to do. You have to lay aside the weight and the sin that doth so easily beset you. You are carrying a weight by choice that you don't have to carry. There is nothing for God to take from you. You must lay it down. A part of worship is demonstrating you appreciate on some level the bigness, the majesty, the glory of your God. A part of worship is how you live every day. Worship isn't just something that comes out of your mouth or is an activity of your feet and your hands clapping and stomping. Worship is behavior that demonstrates your adoration and appreciation of God. And what more demonstrates our adoration or appreciation for someone by placing them as a priority over other things? You will have to lay aside that weight that's stopping you from worshiping. Perhaps you are doing too much and you need to slow down on the doing so that you can appreciate the being. You understand what I'm saying today? And then finally, Martha is anxious and unsettled. I want you to take note of uh, when Jesus is speaking to Martha, he says in verse 41, he says, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. You are anxious and worried about many things. I spy in this that Jesus, as he so often does, looks deeper into the motivations of people. He looks deeper into her heart, into her life, and discerns that she's carrying weights that have nothing to do with what's happening in the kitchen. She has concerns and worries that go beyond what is happening in this moment. But now all of that is being visited upon her all at once because of this circumstantial frustration that she's experiencing. Now, this is what I'm saying to you that we often reach a point in life where there are so many things on us and we are so overwhelmed by the responsibilities that we have voluntarily adopted. We are so beset by our own mismanagement of our own time and our own energy and our own attention, our own self-induced trauma, that any little thing that happens throughout the course of the day can cause us to explode. It's not the little thing that happened. It's the big weights that we are carrying that allow us to be sparked by trivial things. Martha's response to this whole situation is out of proportion with what is happening. I want you to look at your own life. How often during the course of the day are you reacting and responding to things out of proportion to what's happening? How often do you blow up small things and make them much bigger than they really have to be? And is it really about that thing that's going on? Or are you carrying this enormous burden on your shoulder that won't allow you to take one more incident, one more event? And is what's going on about the other people or persons with whom you believe you're frustrated? Or are you really frustrated at yourself because you are not in the right place and life storms are overtaken? you.
we have to be in the right place. And so Martha is anxious and unsettled. So the work that she's doing in the kitchen, not enough to satisfy her. She is not finding fulfillment in what she is doing. She's rattled, she's frazzled, she's frustrated, she's vexated. And it goes deeper than that work she's doing in the kitchen. There's a purpose why the scripture shares this account with us. And it's not that someone got frustrated that they were the only one working in the kitchen. It's what verse 41 says. Verse 41 says, Martha, you're worried about a lot of stuff. Too much stuff. You're unfocused. You're not being purposeful in the actions of your life. You are not discerning where God wants you to be and what God wants you to be. And what are those things that you need to do versus those things that you are actually doing? Do you understand what are the needful things in your life? Someone once told me, and I believe that it's true, that if everything is important, then nothing's important. We know the priorities in our lives by what we're able to give up for them. If you say that something is the most important thing in your life, then you're willing to surrender and sacrifice everything else for that one important thing. When you say that Christ is everything in your life, is there anything that you're withholding from him that you are not willing to sacrifice? Because once you find that thing or those things, then we can establish that Christ is not the most important experience in your life. That in fact you have these other sacred cows that you're not willing to give up for the cause of Christ. And so when you get frustrated in life, please understand that as a child of God, it's because you are not standing where God wants you to be because you have not fully submitted to his will. You're holding back on God. Then we want, so we're looking at Martha as someone who represents the work, the person who works, 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 works. And by the way, before I go to Mary, let me say this, that we as a family of God have to be careful because we love people based on the work that we do. And we make them feel like they're going to get into heaven because they've done so much work. We are saved by grace through faith. And none of that comes about because of us. Because if it did, we would boast. It is the grace of God that saves us. And even the faith we have to obtain and embrace that grace, that faith comes from God. God gave us that gift of faith as well as the gift of grace. We owe everything to God. So we can't esteem ourselves more highly than we should. So when we look at Mary, we see a model then of worship. As in Martha, we see a model of working. Working to establish one's own personal work. Working as the end all to be all. Working as though that is the framework for a healthy and balanced life. When in fact, it is worship that's our needful thing. What is worship? Activity done to demonstrate or express reverence and or adoration for God the Father and or Jesus Christ, his son. An expression of reverence and adoration for God the Father and Jesus Christ, his son. When we see Mary, Mary leaves her work in the kitchen once Christ enters the home. I want you to embrace that action. She leaves her work once Christ enters the home to attach herself to Jesus. One would argue the work she was doing in the kitchen was a necessary thing in order to make the meal happen. You're missing the point here. She demonstrates that in a moment, once the presence of Christ is discovered, discerned, felt, one has a, re one has a responsibility to acknowledge that presence and not simply work through it. When the presence of Christ is discovered, discerned, felt, one has a responsibility to acknowledge that presence and not just to work through it. It is, it is, it is so for me 
in the course of a service when the word is going forth or songs of Zion are being sung or some form of ministry is going on to watch people muddle about doing things that have nothing to do with anything. Chatting up neighbors uh, in the pews, going over to someone they haven't seen in a while to say hello while worship is happening. Folks are walking to and from. It demonstrates that you can be in the presence of the Lord and not know you're in the presence of the Lord because you don't know what that's like because it's not something that you're very familiar with because it doesn't happen for you very often. And that can even happen with folks who have been in the church for years because as I established from the outset, you can get to the point where church becomes about the work and not about the worship. And we have to be careful. And particularly now, what we are going through as a, as a world, what we are going through as a world is exposing the weakness of our religious activities. We are fighting over whether or not churches should be open, whether or not it should be mandated that we socially distance in church, whether or not it should be mandated that we wear masks in church. And we are completely glossing over the fact that we have not learned at all that the church is not the building, it's the people. We are the church. We are having church right now. If you are paying attention to me and you are truly invested in this moment, you are listening for the Holy Spirit to speak to you and clarify things for you, then you are part of a church experience right now. Where two or three are gathered as touching on any one thing, I promise that I will be in the midst. The Lord is with us right now in this virtual congregation, in this virtual assembly. For all of us who are dialed into his presence, who for these few moments have left our work and we have chosen to worship. Me speaking the word of God, you listening to the word of God, demonstrates our adoration and appreciation for God himself. And therefore, what we are doing right now is worship. We have suspended our work for these moments to take care of this needful thing. Because though we cannot congregate in a physical building, it doesn't stop us from to coming together. We are shut in, but we are not shut out. Church is still happening. Somebody say praise the Lord. So she leaves that work in the kitchen. We have no evidence that she's not going to eventually go back. But the Lord is present, and I can't just work through that. I need to experience that. That's worship. Mary takes a, a place at the feet of Christ. That's the disciples' posture. Not only does she know where to be when the Lord is present, she knows how to be. She places herself at the feet of Christ. Christ says about her, she has the better part. She has humbled herself to her Lord. Oh, that we would learn to humble ourselves to the Lord. When we pray in church, we have often the habit of either bowing our heads and closing our eyes or kneeling at the altar. It is a uh, it is symbology. It is emblematic of us humbling ourselves before the Lord. But that posture can't just be physical. It also has to be spiritual. In our hearts, with our lives, we must place our feet ourselves at the feet of Christ. It is the position of one who is needing to be taught. It is the position of one who is waiting to be discipled, to be led, to be trained. That's how we ought to be, saints. When you go to your midweek Bible study and prayer services, you are posturing yourselves at the feet of Christ. The person of God who is teaching you at that moment becomes an embodiment of the oracle uh, or the wisdom of God. But truly, your posture of leaving whatever your momentary assignments are and, and just for an hour's worth of time, exposing yourself to the taught word of God, the declared word of God, or some prayer service, uh, you are demonstrating this posture that Mary takes 
at the feet of Christ. When is the last time, besides the Sunday morning, that you were at the feet of Christ? When is the last time you submitted yourself to Bible study? When is the last time you submitted yourself to a prayer service? That's a disciple's posture. You can't be discipled if you're not putting yourself in the presence of the Lord. And what God does is he uses people to represent his presence. He has given some apostles, right? He has given some evangelists. He's given some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the church. That's why they exist. So if you are of the church, you need to be perfected, which means you need to be taught. You need to be led. You need to be discipled. That is representative of yourself posturing yourself at the feet of of Jesus Christ when you submit your time and your presence to be taught the things of God to be strengthened in the things of God to pray with and to pray for others Mary becomes an example of what it means to worship not to just hurl praises at God from our mouths but by our very behavior to demonstrate how much we love and adore him Mary is listening to the word if being at the feet of Jesus is a disciple's posture, then listening to Jesus is a disciple's practice. Listening, taking in the teachings of Jesus, and that's not just taught uh, by Bible study teachers or Sunday school teachers, but it's also reading the word for yourself and listening for the Spirit to teach you the things of God. Because that's the Lord's promise. That his spirit would lead and guide you to what was actually real and true. Do you exhibit the disciples' practice the way Mary did? Are you listening to Jesus? Are you listening for the spirit to speak into your life? Are you putting yourself in a position so that the Lord could actually speak into your life as an individual? Mary demonstrates that for us as she is attentive to the word or words of the Lord. And then finally, Mary implicitly feels rewarded to be in Christ, Christ's presence. She is content in her worship of Christ. Christ looks at her and says, she has the better part. I'm talking to a lot of you today who find yourself even now, though we are not corporately worshiping physically, some of you find yourself busier than you were when we were at church just to kind of keep the church together. You're not the pastor or anything like that. You may not even be a leader of an auxiliary or anything, but you are one of that, those 20 percenters who actually keep the church going. God bless you. We love you. But please don't let us interfere with your worship. Some of you are working hard to make ends meet, working overtime, working extra time to reach your financial objectives. You work so much, you have nothing left to give to God. Please don't let your material goals interfere with your worship. God is not impressed by how much money you make. God is not impressed by your rate of promotion. God is not impressed by how many hours you work. God is impressed when you demonstrate faith in him. Without faith, Hebrews 11, it is impossible to please God. We must demonstrate our faith to him. Mary has the better part. You are carrying a weight in your life that is so heavy, it is distracting you from your primary purpose, which is to be a worshiper what we are learning on Wednesday nights in our Bible studies is that church is not a group of thinkers. It is not a group of workers. Church is a group of worshipers. We come together to extol the greatness of our God. We come together to declare his goodness. We come together to sing and speak his praises. We come together to seek his face. 
to wax stronger in him. And according to Paul, to make each other stronger in him. Proverbs telling us that iron sharpens iron. That's who we are. Because God is whose we are. And I don't want you to lose sight of that. Because God doesn't want you to lose sight of that. You are a child of the Most High God. And you have been left here on earth to demonstrate His love to herald his life as represented in his son Jesus Christ who came here to take upon him the sin of humanity and to pay the penalty for that sin and then conquer that sin both in the flesh and in death and having been victorious he is now sitting at the right hand of the father and he has left us here to represent him in the earth. But in order to position yourself so that you can represent him in the earth, you are going to have to maintain a life of worship. Worship. Behavior that demonstrates that you have some appreciation for the power, the strength, the bigness, the value of your God. The disciples' posture. You sit at the feet of Jesus with an expectation of gleaning from him. The disciples practice. You listen through prayer, through study, both organized study with others, but also study on your own. These are the behaviors that God is looking for in this time. Let us give God what belongs to God. Father, we thank you today for your loving kindness toward us. Lord, we often need help to remember that needful thing, worship. We often need help to reorient us. Life becomes all about the urgent things, so much so that we forget about the important things. We're putting out fires everywhere, but not really accomplishing anything that's truly meaningful in our lives. And Father, we don't want to be that way. We want to live out your purpose for us. We want to do your purpose each and every day in some way in our lives. We want to demonstrate the love of the Father. We want to demonstrate the power of Christ. We want to be able to declare the gospel, but also live in a way that draws attention to your goodness, God. We pray your guidance. Give us the wisdom to do so. Give us the patience we need. Give us the grace we need. Lord, give us the love that we need. We pray these things in Jesus' name. If you are under the sound of my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you can today. Remember, all have sinned. You're not alone. All of us have sinned. All of us have come short of God's glory. But I also want you to know that God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, he didn't wait for us to get right. He made provision for us to be right. While we were yet for us. He not only died for us, but three days later, he rose again with, with victory over death, hell, the grave, sin. Now because he lives, he's paid the price. We can live also. So he says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest for your souls. Do you want to rest from the weariness of your sin? Sin's wearing you down. You're tired. You're hopeless. And you know you need to have Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. God speaking to you today and he's breaking your heart and you're ready to come home. Let me lead you in a word of prayer. This is your day. Are you ready? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your love and your kindness toward me. Father, I know I don't deserve anything from you. But I believe you sent your son to die for me. And I thank you that the price of my sin was paid for. I ask your son, your living son, to come into my heart today by your spirit, to rule inside me, to lead and guide me, to make my life what you've designed it to be, God. I confess that I am a sinner, but I know that now I am saved by your grace. And I receive that grace. And I receive your forgiveness. And I receive your son. And God, I receive your spirit into my life. I believe it by faith. Thank you, God, 
for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Now, find yourself a Bible-believing church to nurture you, to disciple you in the faith. God bless you. Thank you all. Remember the Trice family in prayer this year until we meet again next Sunday. God be with you.